is with great honor that our first speaker today is Nathan Spilov. So Nathan has written his own biography, which all the biographies today are written by the presenters. Um, Nathan is an autistic YouTube actor, activist. He goes everywhere with his service dog, SSD Blake, and has been acting since he was in elementary school. Nathan is currently a graduate student at the University of Northern Iowa in the Department of Communication Studies, where he teaches oral communication and coaches the UNI speech team. He hopes to continue to teach and coach tomorrow's activists far into the future. Nathan is very excited for the opportunity to tell his story. Nathan. This was 
So one of the original ideas that this was based on was a false belief test that was carried out by a man named Simon Barrett Cohen. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because he is the cousin to one Sasha Baron Cohen. Yep, Borat. Uh, apparently they have a, very, a lot of very smart people in the family. Uh, so Simon Baron Cohen is, a, is globally famous for his research into people on the autism spectrum. So he carried out what he called, uh, what, what is referred to today as the Sally Ann experiment also known as the false belief experiment. And the way the experiment was carried out is basically there were, uh, and they, they had three groups of people. They had a group of autistic children, they had a group of children with Down syndrome, and they had a group of neurotypical children. For those of you that uh, are unfamiliar with the term neurotypical, neurotypical is what we autistics call the rest of y'all. It's the autistic community's equivalent of saying you're a muggle. <laughs> so, so you have a group of autistic children, a group of children with Down syndrome, and a group of neurotypicals. And the way the experiment was carried out, they had two dolls, one named Sally, one named Anne. And they were, each child was uh, you know, led into a room. And in that room, there was a bag, and there was a basket, and there was a marble. What they did was they had the Sally doll put the marble into the bag, and then she left the room. And then after she left the room, they had the Ann doll pick up the marble and put it in the basket. And then Sally came back into the room. And they asked each kid, where is Sally going to look for the marble? And what they found, and, and to, you know, just to clarify something, they did test the memory of each participant to make sure that that wasn't a factor. What they found was that the neurotypical children, most of them very quickly said, well, she's going to look for it in the back because that's where she put it. Most of the children with Down syndrome said the same thing. She's going to look for it in the back. But most of the autistic children said that she was going to look for it in the basket, because that's where it was. And, and I find it interesting, uh, based on my own experience, because I often have trouble getting outside of my own mind and understanding why a person can think something that is just straight up wrong. When I was a kid, I got into an argument with my entire class I think it was, like, it was either first grade or second grade, about which direction north was. They thought it was up, as in up. And I was like, no, it means up, as in, it's up as in up on a map. And it was just this raging argument that lasted for like two months. And my entire class was like, no, Nathan, it's up. Now it's up on a map, like look at a map. If you look at a map, it's flat, it's based on a... Anyways, still salty about this. <laughs> um, and finally, we went to the teacher who confirmed that I was correct, because I was. <laughs> and you know, me being, me being the autistic that I am, I thought, <coughs> well, they should thank me because I corrected them. They were saying something that was absolutely ludicrous, and I corrected them, and they no longer sound ludicrous. I mean, they didn't thank me. It's okay. I'm over it now, as you can probably tell. But the, the, the thing is, the conclusion of this experiment was basically that autistics lacked the ability to access theory of mind. Now, there are a few things about this experiment that I would like to point out. It was done in 1985. Now, the autism spectrum has expanded quite a bit. What we think of autism today is not necessarily what people thought of autism back then. 
uh, the spectrum has been expanding. Now, a lot of people have probably, uh, have probably seen that the number of people diagnosed with autism has increased over the last few decades. Now, some people might attribute that to things that uh, it has that have no business being attributed to, like uh, you know, vaccination. But what, one of the major drivers of this increase in diagnoses is simply the fact that the spectrum has been broadening. Our ability to detect it at a young age it is getting better. So there, that's one limitation of the experiment. Another limitation of the experiment, I would say, is that it was focused primarily on children, which a lot of experiments nowadays are focused on children on the autism spectrum. Now, I don't know if you all know this, but it's true. Children grow up, and we eventually become less adorable, and therefore less interesting to people that like to study us, which is very unfortunate. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be studying kids on the spectrum. I'm saying we autistics could use some love, too. So, This experiment has been cited uh, throughout a lot of research that I've done uh, ever since then about the idea of theory of mind. So this leads into empathy. So empathy, as, as a lot of you all know, is basically the ability to feel for, one, for a person. But Sash Baron Cohen, same guy that uh, did the um, Sally Ann experiment, he actually eventually expanded upon the idea of empathy and separated it into two categories, two things that go into empathy. He defined those as cognitive empathy and emotional or affective empathy. So let's talk about affective empathy. Affective empathy, or emotional empathy, is the desire to give the appropriate response to someone. So if someone is in emotional hardship, apathetic empathy is the desire to comfort them, the desire to give them support. Alternatively, or not alternatively, but uh, uh, on the other hand, Cognitive empathy is the knowledge of what the appropriate response is. So knowing what you should do in order to comfort someone. So cognitive is knowing what to do. Affective is the desire to do it. And one of the things that he talks about is, because uh, oftentimes uh, autistics are compared to, uh, to sociopaths. And the difference that he points out when it comes to sociopaths is, yes, there is a deficit in empathy, but it's the opposite. So what he says is that autistics, based on studies that he's done, do actually have affective empathy, but not cognitive empathy, or at least they have impairments in cognitive empathy. On the other hand, uh, when it comes to sociopaths, he argues that it's the opposite. They have cognitive empathy. They know exactly, they know what the right response is most of the time, but they don't necessarily have the desire to, um, to give the proper response. So the way that they came up with this idea that autistics have Apathetic, or uh, sorry, um, uh, the, the autistics have uh, affective empathy, but not cognitive empathy, was this test that they carried out where they showed pictures of individuals and asked the autistics uh, that were involved in the experiment to explain what they're, uh, what they're feeling at that moment. And, what might be the appropriate response? So that was used to measure cognitive empathy. 
And what they found was that most of them had trouble figuring out exactly what the appropriate response was. But as soon as, they, as, soon as the uh, researcher explains to the autistics that um, this is what they feel and this is what the appropriate response is, they had a desire to do that, uh, to, um, to give a reaction that was appropriate based on that knowledge that they had. So basically, we autistics don't, it's not that we don't care about how you feel, it's that we sometimes don't know how to empathize with you, how to give you what you want. One of the things that my dad often says, my dad's also on the spectrum, one of the things my dad often says is that the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, doesn't necessarily work with autistics because what we want done to us is often different from what neurotypicals want done to them. For example, if I was walking around saying, hey, north is up, and that was wrong, I'd want people to correct me. Apparently, neurotypicals don't. <laughs> I don't get it. But neurotypicals don't. So, and again, when I say neurotypicals don't, I don't necessarily, uh, when I say autistics throughout this presentation, and when I say neurotypicals throughout this presentation, I'm not making overarching statements. I'm not trying to generalize. Uh, you know, you'll, there's always exceptions to the rule. Uh, we actually have a saying in the autism community, you met one autistic, you met one autistic, um, we're all different, and a lot of the things that I talk about in this speech might not necessarily be the case for a lot of autistics. So to be, you know, to go ahead and throw that down. So, so let's come back to what I've talked about with theory of mind, and how I think that our method of determining that autistics don't have cognitive empathy is kind of limited in scope. Now, everything, all the research that I've presented to you that has been done thus far, I think has value. I do. I think it has value in understanding. Uh, and understanding the experiences of people on the autism spectrum. However, there's one more idea that I would like to pose to you. When they were doing the experiment where they were showing pictures of people. And they were showing pictures of people either in emotional distress or um, whatever situation they happened to be in. Who do you think they were showing to the autistics? They were showing neurotypicals. They weren't showing them autistics, they were showing them neurotypicals. They were measuring their ability empathize with neurotypicals, not necessarily autistics. And what I'm saying is that that is what I like to refer to as neuronormative. Creating this overarching statement, this overarching theory about theory of mind, when you're not necessarily taking into account, well, what about the ability to get yourself outside of your mind and put yourself into someone with a similar neurotype. So what I would say is that everything that Simon Baron Cohen said and researched is probably accurate. However, I would add a specification when talking about theory of mind. Theory of neurotypical mind. Because when you're saying theory of mind, you're assuming that the mind is automatically neurotypical. That a mind is an inherently neurotypical uh, entity. But it's not. 
I, I, I hear that you're gonna be learning a lot more about the social model approach to disability later today. Uh, so I'm, I'm not gonna get too much into that. But basically, uh, in a quick summary, it's the idea that we shouldn't be, uh, that one of the most disabling aspects of disability is not necessarily the disability itself, but rather society's view of that disability, the way society treats that disability. The fact that that disability does not represent the entire society. The fact that people within society in the case of, uh, you know, in the case of autistics versus neurotypical, that a majority of people are neurotypicals. Now, if the majority of people thought like autistics, suddenly we would be the normal ones. I think that'd be an awesome world, personally. <laughs> I mean, not that not, I, some of my best friends are neurotypical, so I, no offense. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I. I, I know a lot of, there's a lot of people on the spectrum that are in my family. I know a lot of people that are, uh, I have a lot of friends who are on the spectrum. And I think that they have very unique perspectives. So what I am proposing, when we are talking about the idea of theory of mind, is the idea of theory of autistic mind. So if you took an autistic, and you try to measure their ability to empathize with another autistic, how might that look? Would those results be different? Now, in the research that I've done thus far, I haven't heard, I haven't uh, found any research articles that are uh, specifically doing that. So that's actually what I'm doing this semester. Now, it's gonna be a qualitative paper, so it's gonna primarily be uh, interview based with several people on the spectrum and asking them about uh, what exactly they, how exactly they feel empathy towards other autistics in relation to neurotypicals. So it's not necessarily going to be going to draw definitive conclusions, but I think it should be expanded upon. Because here's the thing when a neurotypical comes up to me and says, I am so upset. This person is wearing the same shirt as me today. I have no idea what to say. Like to me, it is so illogical to be thinking, or to legitimately be upset because someone else is wearing the same clothes as you. That makes no damn sense to me. And I mean, when you look at it logically, it shouldn't. But at the same time, when, enough, when I'm legitimately upset or in distress about uh, not being able to sit in a chair that I'm used to sitting in because it's going to throw me off, a lot of neurotypicals, uh, to a lot of neurotypicals, that's kind of like, oh, well, that's, I mean, that's silly. That's funny. And in my opinion, yes, it is funny. It is funny that I get completely thrown off by not sitting in the same seat. I think that's absolutely hilarious. But at the same time, it's a legitimate feeling that I have. It will legitimately throw me off if I'm sitting in a different seat. So if you ask, so what I'm saying is not only should we measure an autistic's ability to empathize with other autistics, we should, we should measure a neurotypical's ability to empathize with autistics and see what the results of that is. Now, I can only speak from my own experience, so take this in the autoethnographic intention that it is presented, or with the autoethnographic intention that it is intended. But in my own experience, as someone on the spectrum, I can point to various examples. So uh, at home, I have a couch. And I love that couch. I never want to give it up. It is the only couch that has ever been comfortable for me. I absolutely love it. My wife hates it. 
My wife absolutely despises it. But I love it. I'm attached to it. Sometimes we autistics get attached to inanimate objects. So when I tell people about that, when I tell other neurotypicals about that, and when I tell them that, you know, I get a little bit upset when my, when, when my wife talks about uh, getting rid of the couch, you know, most neurotypicals just kind of like smile and are like, oh yeah, that's, that's so horrible, you know? But they don't actually understand, uh, they don't, don't actually understand the idea of that, uh, what that attachment means to me. I talk to my dad about it, my dad's on the spectrum, he gets it. He completely gets it. He has a major attachment to inanimate objects. He actually had a couch that he was attached to, that was disintegrated, and his wife, my mother, made him throw it out. And he was devastated by that. He never sat, every time he sat on a couch, ever since that couch, he never felt comfortable. He completely empathized with me on that. Even though to a lot of people that doesn't make logical sense, he empathizes with me on that. Now, this proposition is definitely not perfect. This proposition does have some inherent flaws. For example, going back to the Sally Ann experiment, I would actually characterize that as a much more uh, objective study about the idea of theory of mind. Because it's not necessarily taking into account what the person feels based on facial expressions. I mean, they're dogs. They have one look. They're like, they're two in. They're just dolls. It was just that ability to, uh, to understand how someone could believe something that is false, even though you know that they were out of the room, that they don't have the information, the proper information, in order to understand that. I would say that that is probably, the, that is compelling evidence for a, uh, for a more objective comparison when it comes to determining if autistics have theory of mind. But at the same time, like I said, that study had some limitations. There was a different spectrum. Or there was a different, the spectrum of autism was defined extremely differently. <laughs> So what I'm set proposing is not necessarily a new law of psychology. What I'm proposing is a new area of study, a new methodology. A new methodology that gets outside of the neurotypical narrative, what I like to refer to as the Narrow neuronormative narrative. Try saying that five times fast. Get outside of that and actually bring autistics into these studies, not just as participants, but as researchers. Because these studies are carried out primarily by neurotypicals. And that's, I mean, that's fine. But at the same time, to them, neurotypical is the normal. For autistics, it's not the normal. For autistics, neurotypical is the deviant. So if we can bring more autistic perspectives into these discussions, into these research studies, we can actually create research that not only is accurate and fair and objective, but that doesn't exclude the very people that they are trying to advocate for. And the idea of exclusion of people on the spectrum, people with disabilities in general, when it comes to advocacy, 
is definitely not a new concept. I don't know how many people in this room are familiar with the organization known as Autism Speaks. This organization has done some good things, and I will, I will, uh, I will say that. But this organization also definitely favors a medical model approach. They definitely view autism as the uh, exotic area of study. They have board directors that have like 25 people and they got two autistics on it. And the autistic community had to fight them for years to get even that. That didn't happen until 2015. So the narrative pushed forth by the organizations that exclude autistics are not ones that we should be given as much value. Instead, look towards organizations such as the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. They have a motto, nothing about us without us. So the major thing that you need to understand from this talk is that autistics cannot be excluded from their own narrative. Autistics cannot be talked over. I'm all for researching people on the spectrum. But we need to be involved in that. We need to be involved in that, uh, <coughs> in that process. You know, when it comes to people with disabilities, it feels like we're the only group that people are comfortable excluding from the conversation. You know, if you're having a, if you're having a talk about um, other, mar other marginalized groups, uh, there's more of an understanding that, well, yes, this person they understand their own experience the best, right? But when it comes to people on the spectrum, it's like, eh, I mean, they have the cognitive impairments, so maybe we shouldn't listen to them. Maybe we should talk to the parents, or talk to psychologists, or talk to the teachers. And not that you shouldn't talk to them, but we need to be the ones that drive that narrative. So what I propose, is a theory of autistic mind. A theory that if you take, well, I, at this point I would say it's more of a hypothesis because it hasn't been actually uh, studied. Um, but my hypothesis to build a theory of autistic mind is that if you take an autistic and measure their ability to empathize with another autistic. Maybe they're not going to get it perfectly. You know, I've, I've talked to several autistics about this, and they've said, no, I, even when it comes to other autistics, I have trouble empathizing with them. But I've also talked to a lot of autistics where they say, no, I, it's pretty easy for me to understand what an autistic is saying. Autistics will have a better time empathizing with another autistic. And neurotypicals are going to have a more difficult time empathizing with autistics than they will with neurotypicals. And could we then conclude that neurotypicals are the ones that don't have cognitive empathy? You know, another, uh, another area of study or not, not another area of study, but another uh, alternative um, explanation for why autistics don't feel, don't have cognitive empathy, but they have apathetic, or not apathetic, affective empathy, is an imbalance. There's a guy, uh, a psychologist named Adam Smith, that proposed that what is actually going on is autistics actually feel more cognitive empathy, or more, sorry, more affective empathy, more emotional empathy. And that imbalance is what makes it difficult for them to feel cognitive empathy. So basically, 
We autistics care more than y'all. <laughs> now, I think, uh, I, I think that's a, another interesting approach that should be looked at. But even then, we need to measure the ability of autistics to empathize with other autistics. Because it's easy for me to relate to people that have the same neurotype as me. It's not easy for me to relate to people that have a different neurotype. And I would like to say, because I'd like to open up for questions in just a little bit, but I would like to say that what we need in that fight is allies. What we need in the fight for our movement is allies. We need neurotypicals and autistics alike to stand up and say that autistics must be included in their own movement. Nothing about us without us. This doesn't just apply to academic research. This applies to advocacy in general. Whenever a person stands up and <coughs> declares that it's OK to roll back protections to people with disabilities, we need to stand against them. Whenever someone stands up and says, People with disabilities are given special treatment. They're given special uh, advantages, which you know we would refer to as accommodations. We need to stand against that. And the fact that you have come here to this summit shows that you are ready to take that step. And at, on behalf of the autistic community, I welcome you as an ally. And I hope that together, we can continue to push for a neurodiverse world, a world where we don't just tolerate people of different neurotypes, but we celebrate them, we embrace them, we look at their unique look on the world, and we celebrate it, we listen to it. Because we are not objects of oppression, we're people. And I thank you for coming here to take that step with me. At this time, I would like to open up for questions. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting discussions that can be had about this. So um, I think that we'll be coming around with microphones. Yeah. Basically, it was based on uh, uh, 
and the autistics were people who just had a diagnosis for years ago. All the people in the picture. Um, huh. You know, I, I, I don't remember them specifically. Uh, I don't remember them specifically clarifying that they were neurotypicals, but at the same time, um, uh, I, I would say that it's a safe assumption that they were, because, uh, you know, again, like I talked about in the speech itself, um, autistics are given this idea of, okay, person makes this face, that means they feel this emotion. They make this face, that means they feel this emotion. You know, autistics often won't be necessary, won't necessarily present that face when they're feeling that emotion or recognize it in someone else. So that's why I think it's a safe assumption to assume that uh, the people that were being showed were in fact there. So my question would be, Actually, um, you know, so that's a good question. So when it comes to uh, the spectrum for autism has been broadened ever since the diagnosis, it's broadened uh, even more ever since the diagnosis of Asperger's was removed from the DSM. Now everything is just referred to as autism spectrum disorder. I was actually originally diagnosed with Asperger's. Um, and uh, I would say that in this study you would need a very diverse group of people uh, diverse from diverse parts of the spectrum included in the study. And that's, uh, that would include people that were previously diagnosed with Asperger's or people that uh, were, were diagnosed, uh, that weren't necessarily diagnosed with Asperger's. Uh, as for um, uh, sensory processing disorder? Social communication. Social communication. Um, I, I, don't know, I don't know quite as much about that as a uh, separate diagnosis. Um, I do know that there are similarities, uh, but I would definitely be open to looking at um, to looking at including them in a study like that. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on recent TV and streaming shows like The Good Doctor and Atypical about the representation of autism? Yeah, great question. I actually just recently started watching The Good Doctor, um, and what's kind of interesting about The Good Doctor for me uh, is that. So I have criticisms, and I have uh, I have celebrations of it. Um, so I'm going to start with start with the criticisms, and then go into the celebrations because I think overall it's a good thing. I like the show, um, but my main criticisms are uh, I think that to an extent they are trying to portray a character that isn't necessarily based on interacting with. Uh, people on the spectrum, but rather what you've been told by psychologists. Now, I would need to do more research about how they researched the show, but that's kind of what is presented to me. Uh, or that, that's kind of what it seems like to me in a lot of ways. Um, there are parts of it where it, it kind of felt like they were reading off of a Wikipedia page of what autistics are acting, uh, what autistics act like. Um, and there, there are definitely a lot of moments within the show where um, I can't relate to the character. But at the same time, I would say that that goes back to the idea that you met one autistic, you met one autistic. And I think that the limitations of good doctors could be made up simply by more TV shows being made that represent people on the spectrum. And what I would say is those people that are represented by, that are representing other people on the spectrum need to base their characters on actual autistics. Or, better yet, cast an autistic. Cast actual autistics to play autistics. Um, so, the celebrations I would have for that show were, uh, are kind of brought up on by what started out as a criticism and then became a realization. My first thought was, man, this guy sounds a lot like the Vulcan. And my second thought was, wait a minute, 
When I watched Star Trek, I related to the Vulcans the most. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I, also, I, I sometimes find myself almost acting more autistic after I watch it, as if like the show is giving me permission to be autistic. <laughs> um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that I, uh, you know, I think that a lot of a lot of us on the spectrum, especially those of us that are adults, do often try to take a lot of steps to appear as neurotypical as possible. And that show kind of, uh, after watching it, kind of made me think, you know what? I feel like it's okay for me to um, act a bit more like myself. You know, as for atypical, I haven't seen much of it. Um, I. I had some issues with the first episode, uh, and I was told that they responded to a lot of the criticisms in the second season um, by actually consulting autistics. Who would have thought? Um, but I can't say as much about atypical, though. But uh, I think what is important is there does need to be more representation of autistics within media, and that representation needs to be informed by actual people on the spectrum. You know, they should be involved in the writing process, they should be involved in, you know, if possible, the directing process, and even better, the acting process. But, good question, thank you. There is one area that I'd like to address real quick, uh, which I was actually planning on giving a brief disclaimer for uh, at the very beginning of this presentation. Um, and I forgot to, so I apologize for that. Uh, I'd like to address my use of identity first language as opposed to person first language. You might notice during the speech that I do, that I very rarely say person with autism, I say autistic. And I know that uh, for those of you that might be uh, students within um, special education, you were probably taught that you're supposed to use person first language. You're supposed to say, this is a person with autism, or a, a person with cerebral palsy, or a person with, um, uh, with Down syndrome, or whatnot. Um, now, what I would say, I can't speak to other, pe to other disabilities. Uh, I can only speak from my own experience, and I can only speak from uh, my own status as an autistic, but the way I see it, and the way a lot of autistics actually see it, is that identity first language is actually a lot more um, is actually a lot more preferable because it is acknowledging that yes, autism is a part of who we are. It is a part of our identity. We wouldn't be us without it. And the way I see it, the only difference between person with autism and autistic is the word person. And if you're saying that you need that qualifier in there then you're basically implying that autistics aren't people to begin with. Now, that being said, some autistics might prefer person first language. And you should respect that. You should respect the way an autistic chooses to identify themselves. Now, with me personally, I don't care if you refer to me as a person with autism or an autistic, I'm not gonna get offended one way or another. But some autistics might get offended if you use person first language. Some might get offended if you use identity first language. So ask us. <laughs> we like to state our opinion. Sometimes brought me into situations where I was being bullied or uh, people didn't respond well to me. And it wasn't until I got to high school and found my group, which was the theater, uh, the theater people, and uh, forensics speech, which I now coach, um, that I really started enjoying school. That I really started enjoying 
being around people. Maybe not everybody can say they had a good high school experience, but the important thing is find your group, and it gets better. Because if you had, if you had told me, middle school me, that one day I was going to go to graduate school in Iowa, by the way, I'm from Virginia. For those of you that are adept at geography, you probably know that Virginia and Iowa are not close. <laughs> um, so this was a major change. And for autistics, change is really difficult. But because of that support system that I was able to develop by finding my group, things got better. So that's what I would say. Because you know, and, 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 the, and the funny thing is, if I said that to my younger self, my uh, younger self would probably tell older me to uh, go screw myself. <laughs> uh, because everyone said that to me back then. Um, but I don't know, maybe I trust myself more because, uh, because I, I, I mean, because I empathize with myself and because I have trouble lying. So, uh, so it might not mean as much back then, but it certainly does mean something today that it got better. So one of the big issues we find on our campus is, um, I'll pose it this way, to disclose or not disclose that you <laughs> are an autistic and can our office help or not help yeah. I think as a campus they assume our office is helping all of the students on the autism spectrum which is false because they're not all disclosing just curious on your thoughts about that or other ways as a campus that we can help we've, we've got a task force we're trying to do other things but the more ideas <laughs> would be helpful yeah yeah so I would say that um, you know when it comes to the question of uh, disclose, not disclose, um, the reason why a lot of autistics don't disclose is because we're often in an environment that we don't feel comfortable disclosing. Disability is stigmatized in our society. We don't want people to think less of us, so we don't say anything. And when we don't say anything, we don't get support. When we don't get support, things don't get better. So the first thing I would say is we need to create an environment where autistics feel like they can disclose. They need to feel like that's not going to resort, or that's not going to end with judgment. That's not going to end with, uh, that's not going to end with um, weird stares, or that's not gonna end with people uh, looking at them differently. Now, my policy is if you let everybody know everything about you, nobody ever has power over you. So it's one of the first things that I, uh, that I say when I meet people. I'm, I'm serious. I, I, I have actually introduced myself uh, just to random people in public who have come up to me. They're like, hi, how are you? I'm so-and-so. I'm like, hi, I'm Nathan. I'm autistic. But not all autistics feel that they can do that. So we need to foster a safe environment for them to. Also, they make that choice. That's another important thing. They make that choice. You don't get to choose whether someone else discloses or not. You don't get to force that disclosure for them. Autism is their identity, and it's their choice to say whether or not to, it's their choice to decide whether or not you get to know that. So that's another aspect. Um, and then the third thing I would say is try to not be neuronormative. Uh, when you meet someone, don't assume that they're not autistic. You know, if, they're, if they start behaving in a strange way, if they respond to a loud noise um, with cringes, 
on if they say something socially inappropriate. You can say, oh, well, they clearly don't care about how they make other people feel. Or you can take a step back and think, huh, maybe, maybe they're autistic. Maybe there is something about them that uh, makes it so they say things that we neurotypicals find inappropriate. So foster a safe environment. Don't force disclosure. And don't assume everyone you meet is neurotypical. Thanks for your talk. And I uh, recently did a, a freshman seminar on neurodiversity, and we had a, a, an autistic woman come and speak to the class. And pretty much every student in that final paper talked about Kaylee and what uh, an influence she had on them in being an ally. So my question is, what is the best way for us to find autistics that are willing That's a good question. Um, one thing I would say is uh, the internet is a good place to start. Um, there are resources on the internet that you can look at that has uh, strong self-advocates. Um, what I would say is that uh, you know you, you shouldn't uh, definitely don't go around saying, "Hey, I want to talk to an autistic. Any autistics over there want to talk to me?" No. Go to uh, look at look at websites where autistics have already chosen to disclose their identity and already chosen to be an advocate. Um, uh, and basically, uh, and, and see what they're saying. So I talked about the Autistic Self Advocacy Network. That's a good place to go. Uh, Wrong Planet. That's another good place to go. Um, the Autism Women's Network. That's a good place to go. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's this one guy that I watch sometimes on YouTube. Uh, his YouTube channel is called Ask the World. Um, and of course, uh, one thing I would like to uh, also like to offer, I have a YouTube channel as well that, as uh, Kelly talked about, um, I talk a lot about neurodiversity on my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm actually going to be posting a video just today about uh, an interview that I did with a friend of mine about autism and video games. Um, that YouTube channel is just my name, Nathan Seelow. Um, whenever people comment on it, uh, I, I try to respond to every single comment, and I would be happy to answer any questions, so I can be a resource if you would like. Um, but, but yeah, this, there are a lot of people out there that choose to talk about this openly, Go to them. We have time for one more question. I'm really glad you just brought up the autism and video games. Um, my 12 year old son was diagnosed in the last year with autism. Um, Asperger's would have been one day. And he is obsessed with video games. Um, he's very good at them. And I hear from a lot of my family members, um, don't let him have too much screen time. Um, and my argument is, if he was out playing football, would you tell him to stop playing so much football? Um, I get there's a difference in the two, and he is at physically active as well, but I'm just wondering what your viewpoint is on the video games and yeah. the fact that he's really one tech mind. Sounds a lot like me at 12. Um, I, and actually, in a lot of ways, it sounds like me now. Uh, I definitely do have a one track mind. And I personally play a lot of video games. Um, I, I enjoy video games. I enjoy uh, getting outside of my own experience and putting myself into another character, theory of mind. Um, and, and I think that, I think you make a good point about, like, well, what if we were talking about football? Well, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of dangers to football as well as advantages. Um, you know, there's also a lot of uh, I mean, there, there's also some dangers when it comes to video games. Um, but I would say that a lot of the, the dangers are overblown. 
When it comes to video games, what's important is that it doesn't become a compulsion that takes over other aspects of your life. I actually recently was watching this video on where a guy was talking, where, where a guy was being interviewed about video game addiction, and he was talking about how a lot of people, when they're playing video games, people that like playing video games, uh, they do it because they don't feel challenged in school. And video games not only get more and more challenging and work at your own rate, but they reward you. And that is very appealing to autistics. So I would say, uh, and my, my personal advice would be, um, don't deter the use of, uh, don't, uh, don't deter video games, um, but I think, it's, I think it's fair to make sure that um, the video games are more of a reward rather than a uh, um, rather than his life. So uh, you know, one of the one of the important rules that my parents always had when I was growing up was you know no video games until you finish your homework. Um, I think that's a solid rule. Uh, and I eventually got myself to the point where, to me. Video games are a reward for doing what I have to do. So I get, I go through a long day of work here, and my reward is that I can go home and play video games. And what, and as long as I'm thinking about it as a reward, it's not deterring from the rest of what I need to do. 